and welcome to our Bible study this morning, looking at manna and quail. Um, but we're continuing on looking at these Sunday school stories that many of us have read often in our lives, over and over again, and we're talking to our children about them. And the Israelites are now out of Egypt. So the ten plagues have happened, they're out of Egypt, they have crossed the Red Sea. Uh, Egypt, their army has been completely destroyed. They get to the other side of the Red Sea and everyone's rejoicing and Miriam's breaking out into song and Aaron's singing. And they start to walk through the desert down to Mount Sinai where the Lord had told Moses, right in that burning bush experience, that you're going to go and free these people and then you're going to bring them back here to worship me at Mount Sinai. So that's what Moses is doing. He's bringing those people back to Mount Sinai to worship God. And Moses is in a territory now where he spent 40 years of his life as a shepherd. He knows which way to go. He knows where the water holes are, that the people have their food with them, whatever they brought from Egypt. But they've been out now for a couple of months and they're running low on supplies and they start to grumble against God. Um, we're in Exodus chapter 16, and let me turn to it just a second. Exodus chapter 16 says this. 15's pretty long. All right, here we are. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, right, so about 75 days, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So we, we heard them say a similar thing when they got to the Red Sea. Right? Oh, why did you bring us here? If only we, we should go back to Egypt because there at least we would be fine. And, and what did you do, Moses? You brought us out to the desert to die? Now, Moses, what are you doing? You brought us out to the desert to starve to death? We don't have any food. And the Lord says, I am going to send you food. The Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people will go, go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron go out and they, they let them know, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be bread raining down from heaven. The Lord who brought you out of Egypt is going to do this. He's heard your grumbling. Um, the Lord is going to give you meat in the evening and bread in the morning because he has heard all of your grumbling. So they say to him, right, this is what's going to happen. They, they repeat it again as we go through chapter 16. And he sends them manna and quail. So that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about the manna and the quail. Let's start with quail, okay? Because uh, if, if you're in Nevada, you've probably seen a quail. They're running all over the place. Uh, and when I think of a quail... Um, well, these are some verses, right? Heard the grumbling, be filled with bread, you'll know I'm God. That evening, Exodus 16, 13, quail came and covered the camp, the Lord did it. But when I think of quail, I think of a picture like this, you know? Think of that big bird and it's got the little thing on the front of its head, that's how I know it's a quail. I'm not really into birding, I don't know a lot about birds, but when I see a quail, a little thing on its head like this, I know it's a quail, right? Same thing if I see a you know, big pink head on a big black bird, I, I know it's a vulture. There's, there's very few birds I can identify, but you know, quail, vulture, bluebird, cardinal, I don't know. I don't have to name for you all the birds I can name. Uh, but, so, 
quail. I think of this. However, this is what's called a California quail. Okay? Um, in my research on quail, this is what's called a New World quail. There are American quail, New World quail, and there's also Old World quail. There are six species of Old World quail, and that's what we want to look at today, because those are the quail that people think the Israelites were eating. Now the quail that uh, we have here, the California quail, they get to be about seven and a half inches tall. Uh, their weight gets up to about seven ounces or so, about a half a pound. So, I mean, even if you got that, you know, it's like enough for maybe one person, maybe enough meat for a day, as long as you have some bread, something to go with it. But the old world quail look like this. They're, they're still alive in the Sinai Peninsula. They're out there and they're actually a little bit smaller than the New World quail. They're only about six and a half to seven inches tall. They weigh slightly less and they don't have that little thing on the top of their heads. But what they do have in common with the quail that we see is they don't perch in trees. They're on the ground. They, they spend most of their time scratching in the dirt looking for ground animals and, and nesting on the ground. So the Lord, by this miracle, brings all of these birds into the camp every single evening and somehow allows the Israel to go out and, and gather them. Now whether they trap them or they're just able to walk out and pick up whatever quail they need, I don't know. The, the Bible doesn't go into that. But this, hopefully, is now the picture you have in your head for the quail that the uh, Israelites were eating. Now the next thing we get to is manna. And the word manna, which you probably know, means what is it? So when the Israelites saw it the first time, they just said, what is it? And then they named it, what is it? The Lord said he's going to rain down this bread from heaven. It's going to show up every morning when the dew disappears. And it's basically going to sustain them. They're in the desert. They're in the wasteland. They're going to need food every single day. Well, what does the Bible tell us about the manna? Because they said, what is it? But we do learn a few facts about it. We learn when the dew was gone, the flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. So it's flaky. It's on the ground. It's on the desert floor. It says, it was white like coriander seed, and it tasted like wafers made with honey. Okay? So these are the things that we know about it. And we know that it was baked into gum, and it kind of had this feel of resin. So there, there are a number of different theories to what this possibly could be. People, whenever they look at the Bible, they, they try to find a natural uh, explanation for the way that God did things. And I mean, sometimes, great, you know, God sometimes works through natural means to do amazing things. The fact that there, there are many diseases now that I don't have to worry about that a hundred years ago people would be terrified of because of the gifts that God has given to our society. The vaccines, the, the treatments that he has allowed our society to have. I mean, they're, they're just miracles by the standards of the, the history of mankind. But we don't have to deal with those things. So people look for these natural means thinking, oh, okay, the Bible didn't know about these things. But we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But here are some of the explanations that people have for what this manna might have been. There is a plant called the Tamarix gallica. Okay, Tamarix gallica. And the Tamarix gallica is a plant that lives in, it's, it's in the Sinai region, but it's mainly around uh, the, the water areas near the seashore. 
And this plant produces this kind of resin that comes out of it. So a little bit of sap that comes out of the plant slowly. And it, when it drips down and it lands, then it dries on the ground and it ends up looking like this. Th these little flaky kind of wafer thingies. And it tastes kind of sweet. And it's, it's white, right? Like a coriander seed is white. Coriander seed that's, I mean, not looking like little seeds, but white like the seed. And you can grind it up and make kind of a, a porridge type thing out of it. This, however, doesn't have a lot of nutritional value. This is used as a, as a diuretic, okay? Um, you can make it into a paste and it kind of works like calamine lotion, but it's really not something that you could live off of, okay? A lot of nutrients. Another thing that people say is maybe it is, I'm doing the scientific names for these things, it's the Glyceria flui tans. Again, I don't have a degree in botany, so excuse my pronunciation of these plants. But this plant is known as water manna. Okay, and this grows in wetter regions, and it has these uh, little kind of flowers on it that drip down. And as they drip down, people kind of tap the, the plant so that it falls onto the ground. And then when it lands on the dew, it slowly grows a little bit in size and people can gather it up and eat it. And it does have a little bit of a sweet taste to it and people make porridge out of it. So possibly could be some sort of this plant. But again, this is in marshlands that this plant grows and the children of Israel are in the middle of the desert. The point is, is we don't know what the manna actually was. We don't. We, we don't know if it came from a plant, if God used natural means to take care of it. There are these plants all over. Um, there, there's another, there's actually a few stories um, that come out of Central Europe in like the 1840s and 1850s about different manna experiences. One of them, they, they woke up in the morning and there was kind of a flaky uh, flower-like covering everywhere. Um, and they said it was kind of like manna after this thunderstorm. They don't really know the cause of that. And it's so long ago, I don't know if we can trust the um, story that was there. there there's also um, was an example in Asia where one morning this this huge cloud of insects came in and they were really small and white and they died overnight and just made piles and piles of these insects all over the place and they were edible and then the next day they they turned bad so again those are a couple more explanations but when we look at the bible when we read the bible because the bible is our source of truth. But we're not looking at 20th century uh, philosophers and scholars and saying, what do you think happened there? We have the Bible, right? Written by the Holy Spirit through his prophet Moses, who is there writing this down, telling us what happened. First hand account here in the Bible, rather than someone 4, 3,500 years later guessing what happened. So we want to listen to the Bible and said, and the Bible says this, each morning everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. Okay, possibly a resin that it could be melting away. However, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two homers for each person. Two homers is about six pounds. That's a lot of this stuff. And the leaders of the community came to report this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it to morning. Nevertheless, some of the people 
went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why in the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day, and no one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. If this is just a natural phenomena that is happening for these 40 years, why is it going on six days and every seventh day resting? This is a miracle from God. He is providing for his people, his chosen nation, while they are in the desert. It's not just six days insects come in and the seventh day they don't. Six days these plants produce this resin, but on the seventh day they don't. And if, even if that is the case, it's still miraculous that God is controlling these plants in weak cycles to be able to provide for the people and give them enough. Six pounds per person? I mean, how many of these plants are there? If you have too many million people around, right? Six pounds a person? Twelve million pounds of plant resin being produced every day? I don't know how many plants it is. But that is amazing that this is happening. And only for those 40 years. It's not like other, other people at that time had this going on, right? It's not like the people knew about this. It's not like Moses knew about this beforehand. You got, oh yeah, you can just go out in the desert and survive all you want. You just got to eat that white stuff that shows up in the morning. No, this is a, a thing that happens to them while they are there. Another point, Joshua 5.12. The manna stopped the day after they ate the food from the land. Talking about Canaan. And they crossed the Jordan River, finally with Joshua. After the, the people that had complained against God and Moses ten different times, saying, I wish we could go back to Egypt and die there. God finally said to them, none of you are going to enter the promised land. Everyone 18 and over is going to wander around the desert for 40 years until this generation dies off, except for Caleb and Joshua, the two spies that went into uh, Israel and said, we can go because the Lord is fighting with us. But everyone else, you're not going to enter the promised land. You're going to wander around. You're going to eat manna. You're going to eat quail every single day. And the people got tired of it. They did. 40 years of only eating the same thing. Now, I don't know what spices they had to throw on that quail, but they're not having Indian quail, and then they're having Chinese quail, and then they're having barbecue. They're eating it the same way every single day. It is just nutrition to keep them alive. They are tired of eating it. But it was a miracle that God gave to them to keep them alive, because he loved them, because he cared for them, because he was testing them every single day. They went to bed without food for the next day. And every single day, well, I guess, except for the sixth day, they woke up and God provided for them. He taught them, trust me, trust me, I will take care of you. It's so easy for us, right, to uh, think to ourselves that I have to do this, right? I have to provide for myself. I have to store up all of these things. And yeah, it's good to plan ahead. It is. But at the same time, sometimes we, we forget to trust our God. We forget to remember that he's taking care of me today. He's going to take care of me tomorrow. Jesus said the same thing, right? Look at the birds of the air. Do they toil or, or, or are they anxious? Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. They're, they're sold for a penny, but not one of them falls to the ground without your Father in heaven knowing about it. And the flowers of the field, right? Today they're here, tomorrow they die. But not even Solomon in all of his majesty was clothed as beautiful as these. We, we have a lot of things that we worry about in this world. But God loves 
you, his child. Continue to pray to him. Ask him for your daily bread. Use the gifts and abilities that he has given to you and the resources he has put in front of you to, to take care of yourself and the people around you. But know that your God loves you. Know that if he needed to take care of you, he could send Brenda out from heaven. He could send a quail into your house to feed you. He has all the power. To him be the glory. Thanks for listening today. I uh, hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.